So let's go to the um, offshore uh, potential power, Mike Clancy. Um, he's been a researcher, oceanographer uh, for a long time uh, at the Stennis Space Center in, uh, is that Missouri? Where is that? Mississippi. Mississippi, Mississippi. Um, and uh, then he was at uh, Fleet in America, which is the Navy uh, weather facility here in Monterey. Uh, spent a, pretty much a career there, became the highest uh, ranking, paid maybe in ranking, uh, mm -hmm. civilian employee in the, in the Navy facility there. Anyway, he's received numerous awards for his uh, research and his achievements and so on. We're pleased. We know we know we're a little familiar with you, Mike, because we've had a uh, couple of presentations around climate change. But anyway, this is a little different subject, and maybe you'll introduce the subject as well as uh, give your presentation. It's being recorded just so people, I just want to remind people that. And so you're on as a co-host, uh, Mike. Thank you, George. I really appreciate you inviting me to give this presentation. And uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So hang on here for a second here, and I'll bring up my presentation. And the title is Offshore Wind Power and the Morro Bay Project. Um, here's a quick outline. I'm gonna talk a little bit about climate change uh, and the need to move to clean energy just to motivate what we're doing here. Then I'm gonna get into the details of uh, the technology of offshore wind power. Then the specifics of the plan Morro Bay Wind Farm you've probably heard about. Uh, talk about possible issues of concern, summary, and then question and answer period. A couple of things I need to tell you up front. First of all, I have no connection to this project. I don't work for any companies involved with this project. I have no interest in working for such, such a company. I am interested in climate change and offshore wind power is an important tool to address that. I'm also a proponent of this project. Now there are positive and negatives associated with any big project like this. I've looked at those and I've come to the personal conclusion that uh, I'm for this project. You may come to a different conclusion, and that's fine. Uh, I do tell you I'm going to be, uh, I promise to be an honest broker in uh, delineating the possible issues of concerns. There's positives and negatives, and you may come to a different conclusion than me, but I'll be an honest broker in, in talking about those. And uh, the big, sort of the main goal of this project is to uh, get you educated about what it's all about, what the technology is all about, and what the, what the issues are. So we'll jump right in on climate change, need to clean, move to clean energy. Uh, there's an overwhelming international scientific consensus on the following three points. Over the past 120 years, the Earth has been warming and the climate has been changing at alarming rates. The global warming and resulting climate change of the past 120 years have been driven almost exclusively by the Earth's greenhouse effect and the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused by human activities. Without dramatic reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the earth will continue to warm and the climate will continue to change to the detriment of humankind. Stated simply, it's happening, humans are causing it, and it's not a good thing. So what are the greenhouse gases that are causing all these problems? Well, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, the fluorinated gases, nitrous oxide, those are the, the big four. And you can see here that carbon dioxide, CO2, is the dominant greenhouse gas. It produces more global warming than the other greenhouse gases combined. Doesn't mean the other gases aren't important. They are, we need to worry about them. But CO2 is the dominant driver of global warming and that's the one we need to address primarily. So here's a plot of CO2 in the atmosphere from 1700 to 2019. And you can see that um, the, the CO2 has increased dramatically with the onset of the industrial revolution. We're now running about 50% above the pre-industrial level. And we're currently putting about 40 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, fear, atmosphere per year as a result of human activities. Where's all that CO2 coming from? Well, mainly China and the US. Uh, between China and the US, we account for more than 40% of emissions. Then it's India, Russia, Japan, and on down the list. But before you get too mad at China, take a look at uh, per capita emissions. There's a lot of people in China, so they drop way down the list. The average American uh, has a carbon footprint of about 16.5 tons per year. That's about twice what the average Chinese has. But Australia and Canada are pretty close behind us. In any case, the US has a significant role to play here. So where is the CO2 in the US coming from? Well, mainly from these three sectors, transportation, electricity generation, in other words, electrification of the power grid, and industry, mainly steel and cement production. Well, the topic today really is focused on electricity generation. So let's take a little closer look at that. Where is it coming from? Well, about 40% of our electricity in the United States is coming from natural gas. 
20% from coal, 20% from nuclear, and 20% from renewables. So let's break out the renewables here. And uh, it's mainly um, the, the number one renewable is wind, 8.4%, then hydroelectric, solar, although solar is increasing rapidly, will eventually overtake wind, biomass, and geothermal. So we're really focused today on what it's going to take to really grow the wind power and bring down the, the uh, fossil fuels, natural gas, and coal. So with that as an introduction, I want to now jump in on the, on the issue of offshore wind power. And I want to begin by showing you this map of US wind resource. So what we're looking at here is wind power classification from FAIR, which is like this color here, all the way up to superb, which is blue here. And what you see is there's this big swath of, 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 of uh, a lot of wind resource right in the Midwest here. But also there's an awful lot of wind resource, very high quality wind resource along the coastal waters of the US. In fact, some of the best wind power available in the US lies offshore within our 200 mile exclusive economic zone. Now offshore wind turbines are much larger and therefore more efficient, we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, than their land-based counterparts. And they also benefit from the stronger and more consistent winds over the sea as we were talking about earlier. If fully developed, the offshore wind power available to the US would actually produce enough electricity to double the current amount of electricity we use on the power grid. There's a lot of resource out there. And the Biden administration, in fact, just came out with a big announcement yesterday. The Biden administration has a goal of achieving 30 gigawatts of offshore wind power by 2030 and has announced a total of seven possible lease sales across all three coasts of the US by 2025. Now I'm gonna be throwing around the term gigawatts and megawatts quite a bit here. So let's talk about that. Uh, a megawatt is a million watts of electricity and a gigawatt is a thousand megawatts. So that's a billion watts of electricity. A good point of reference here is one megawatt is enough electricity to support about 650, um, 650 average size homes. So the goal here, 30 gigawatts by by 2030, that's enough electricity to support more than 19 million homes. So one gigawatt is 650 uh, homes. That's a good uh, point of reference to remember. We'll begin with talking about a little bit of terminology about these wind turbines. Um, this is the blade, there are three of them. This is the hub where the blades come together. This structure here is called an nacelle. This is an uh, the, the tower. Uh, this is the substructure. It can be either embedded into the bottom or floating. This is a deck. The air gap refers to the space between the bottom tip of the, of the blade to the surface of the ocean. And this region here, or all three blades together are, are called the rotor. And the area of the circle here is called the rotor swept area. Now let's look inside the nacelle. Uh, first of all, on the top of the nacelle, there are meteorological instruments that sense the wind speed and the direction. There is a yaw system which controls the direction of the wind turbine. As the wind change, wind's direction changes, as sensed by the anemometer here, or the wind vane here, uh, the electric motor is engaged and the whole assembly rotates to face into the wind. There's also a pitch adjustment system. Again, there's electric motors that drive this, which, which uh, adjusts the pitch of the blade. So basically, there's a they can make the blades twist here to be at an optimum pitch at a particular given wind speed. At very high wind speeds, the, the blades can be feathered, which means they no longer produce uh, uh, lift. And also there's a braking system that can be engaged here to stop the rotor from turning. That is also engaged to stop the rotor from turning uh, when maintenance is required. The um, offshore wind turbines that, were, that are gonna be part of the Mora Bay project will almost certainly employ what's called a direct drive generator. Very simple uh, device here. Um, what you have are these very powerful fixed magnets that go longitudinally on this outside rim. The inside part of this drum is fixed and involves many coils of, of copper wire. And as the blades turn, these magnets turn around those, those, uh, those area, that region of, of coiled wire, and that's what produces the electricity. Electricity flows back to the power converter and system controller, and there it's converted to 60 cycle, three phase AC at a very high voltage. 66,000 volts is pretty much the standard. And then it's transmitted down the tower and ultimately to shore. So that's pretty much uh, how this thing works. There's computers in here, it's completely automated. Um, humans don't make any intervention here. The, the, the wind turbine adjusts to the wind, the wind speed and direction 
automatically. Uh, although uh, they they can be commands can be sent to the turbine to make it shut down, for example, for maintenance and that sort of thing. So let's take a look at the evolution of wind turbines over the years. And one thing to be aware of is for a given wind speed, the power output from a wind turbine is directly proportional to the area swept out by its blades. That is the rotor swept area we talked about earlier, that circle, which is directly proportional to the square of the blade length. If you think back to your high school math, I'm sure you remember that the area of your circle is equal to pi r squared. Well, r in this case is the blade length. So if you double the size of a wind turbine, you don't get double the power, you get four times the power because two squared is four. If you triple the size of a turbine, you don't get three times the power, you get nine times the power because three squared is nine. So the bigger, the better, bigger is better. And also as you go bigger and bigger, uh, you go to higher altitudes in the atmosphere where the wind is, is stronger. So bigger is better. And the big advantage of offshore wind turbines is they can be built much bigger than onshore turbines. The reason is, uh, although the tower can be built in multiple sections and in in, in transported easily and assembled as, the, as can be the nacelle, no one has figured how to make the blades in multiple sections. The blades are, are made in one continuous section. And we've pretty much reached the limit of how big turbines can get because you got to the point at about 2.5 megawatt uh, turbines, which is kind of the industry standard right now for land-based turbines, you got to the point where you can't transport blades any bigger by land. You just can't do it. They can't, they can't transport on the highway. On the other hand, the offshore wind turbines, you can transport the blades by sea, and that's how it's done. Uh, these, these blades are fabricated right at a seaport, and you open up the uh, factory door, and you transport about 50 yards to the ship, put them on board the ship, and transmit them out to the site. And these uh, wind turbines that we're talking about for the Moore Bay project, they're going to be huge. I'm estimating they're going to be in about the probably the 14, maybe 16 megawatt range, which means they're going to be kind of in this range right here. Well, here's the Washington Monument drawn to scale. The tower is going to be taller than the Washington Monument. I mean, these things are huge. Uh, this is an Airbus A380, which is the world's largest aircraft. It is dwarfed by the size of these wind turbines. So we're talking about really, really large uh, devices here. Now this is instructive. This is a power curve for a typical offshore wind turbine. So what we're looking at here on the vertical axis here is turbine power in megawatts. Remember one megawatt is enough power for 650 homes. And the axis here is wind speed in miles per hour. So we'll start out and move along this curve here. We start out and uh, you're getting zero power out until you hit about six to eight miles per hour of wind. That's because the turbine is just not turning. You got to get to about six to eight miles per hour of wind speed before the turbine starts to begin to turn, rotor begins to turn. And then once it begins turning, um, it, the, the power increases rapidly with wind speed. In fact, it, it increases in proportion to the cube of the wind speed. So very quickly, the power increases. So you get to a point where then it levels off and is held steady. What's happening here is the wind turbine is automatically changing the pitch of the blades, feathering the, the blades to maintain a constant rotation rate, to not go any faster than a certain rotation rate. And the rotation rate, the kind of turbines we're talking about is typically about eight revolutions per minute, which is pretty slow. If you were observing the turbine from a distance, you'd say that's a pretty lazy rate of turning. It takes about seven seconds for it to go all the way around the circle there. But the blades are so large that the tip of the blades are actually moving at more than 200 miles an hour. And that's a lot of stress on those blades. And so that's why they, they throttle them back to be at a constant rate here. And this is, this is kind of the Goldilocks zone here. The wind's not too, not too weak, not too strong. If you get beyond about 50 miles an hour of wind on a big storm, what will happen is the turbine will automatically feather the, the blades and the braking mechanism will be engaged and the turbine will basically shut down. You'll drop down to zero power because it won't be turning anymore. And that's it's basically to, to preserve the, um, the blades. Now, the maximum capacity produced by a turbine when it's in this Goldilocks zone here is called the nameplate capacity or rated capacity of the turbine. You'll typically hear a turbine, it's a 12 megawatt or it's a 14 megawatt. They're talking about the nameplate capacity. It's the maximum energy produced by, by the uh, turbine. There's another uh, a parameter of interest called the capacity factor, and that's the ratio of the long-term, for example, annual average power produced by the turbine to its nameplate capacity. So for example, uh, offshore wind turbines have a 
have typically have a capacity factor of about 60%. That means if if it's the if it's this turbine here with a capacity with a uh, nameplate capacity of six megawatts in the long term, it's going to actually produce about 60% of that. Shore-based, land-based turbines have a much lower capacity factor, about 30 to 40 percent, and that kind of goes back to the question that was asked earlier. How does the wind vary over the land? Well, it, it tends to um, weaken at night, blow stronger during the day. Over the sea, the wind is much more consistent. Also, the turbines are much bigger, and they're more, they're more efficient, and as a result, the capacity factor is larger. So, so, so just, there's a couple of issues at play here. It's more expensive to deploy a wind turbine over, the sea, over offshore. Then a land turbine, on the other hand, they're much more efficient and they produce more power for a given uh, uh, size. And of course, they can be built much bigger. Now, there are basically two types of offshore wind turbines. There are fixed bottom and floating. The fixed bottom is pretty obvious. They're embedded directly in the bottom. Almost all of the, in fact, all of the offshore wind turbines um, on the east coast of the US are fixed bottom uh, turbines. Well, forget about it for California, not going to happen. And that's because they only work down to about 60 meters of depth and the water drops off much too fast all along the West Coast, not just California, the entire West Coast. So any turbines off the West Coast are going to be offshore, are going to be floating wind turbines. And, they're, and they are differentiated by their floating uh, substructure. There's sort of three different ones here. It's called tension lake platform, spar buoy, and semi-submersible. Well, you can forget about tension lake platform and spar buoy. They have, they're problematic in a number of ways. With regard to uh, California, I won't go into details there, but they're not going to be those, I don't believe. I think what we're going to see is going to be the semi-submersible substructure, which is a lot like uh, a floating offshore uh, uh, oil rig, same kind of uh, technology. There's basically uh, chambers that are they're uh, buoyant here, and they actually have take on some water, and you can pump the water between the different chambers to, to balance the turbine out. Be moored in place with something called a catenary, catenary mooring configuration. So what is that all about? A catenary mooring configuration is basically three lines coming down like this. The first half of the line, the mooring line, is a synthetic rope fiber, and the second half of it is heavy steel chain. And it um, terminates in what's called a drag embedment anchor. And a drag embedment anchor looks like this. It's basically a um, a steel plate that angles down. It's drug into the bottom by a tugboat. It, it beds itself about 30 feet into the bottom, comes very, very strong mooring point. And um, typically the um, uh, length of the mooring lines are about um, uh, twice the water depth. So um, the Mora Bay wind farm is, has an average water depth of about 3,000 feet. And so the average mooring line will be about a mile in length. A lot of mooring line is going to be out there. Now, associated with the catenary moored uh, approach is uh, the concept of watch circle. The idea here is that um, the, the uh, wind turbine doesn't really stay in one fixed location. It moves around. Uh, and uh, for example, the wind blows out of the north. It's going to kind of drift down to the south until the, the mooring line that extends to the north becomes uh, tension. Um, and in the, the, the uh, diameter of the watch circle depends on the water depth mooring design and turbine size. For the turbines in the Moore Bay project, the watch circle will probably have a diameter of about two to three football fields. So they're going to be moving around a fair amount here as the wind direction changes. And of course, all the lines below here will be moving around. It's a fairly dynamic environment. This is what the typical subsurface layout will look like for a, for a floating wind farm. And Moore Bay will be much, very much like this. Turbines will be spaced about a mile apart. That spacing, by the way, is given by the size of the rotors here. It typically needs to be about six to eight rotor uh, diameters apart, or otherwise the uh, wind turbine here would be affected by the wind turbulence coming off the one here. So with regard to Mora Bay, we're looking at turbines spaced about a mile apart. Uh, water depth is about 3,000 feet. The, the black lines here are the, are the mooring lines we talked about before. And uh, here's what a mooring line looks like. It's not the kind of line you're going to go down to Home Depot and buy. It's really thick here. These lines here are, the, are called the dynamic array cables. These, these actually transmit the electricity. Whoops, let me go back here. And uh, this pink part here it are actually floats. So the cable comes down like a catenary mooring, but there are floats here. It's suspended about mid water column. This is called the lazy wave configuration. Then it goes along the bottom, it's well grounded, comes back up, 
And then essentially you have lines of these uh, all wired together and then the wires all converge from the wind farm at a floating offshore substation. The dynamic array cables carry the 66,000 volts of electricity. They're very hefty lines. You can see what, what it looks like here. Here's a cross section. Uh, these three copper conductors here carry the three phases of the electricity. You can see it very highly insulated, very well armored around here. Notice this little dot here. That's actually a fiber optic cable, which allows uh, uh, someone ashore to send commands to the wind turbines. From the floating offshore substation, the electricity comes ashore uh, in something called the export cable. For Morro Bay, it'll probably be a number of cables carrying 132,000 volts. The export cables are typically entrenched below the seafloor. They will come ashore at the Morro Bay uh, decommissioned power plant, which is a lot like the Moss Landing plant. And uh, from there, there are all these connections to the grid. And from that point, the electricity will go out to the grid. This is an artist's conception of what a floating offshore substation would look like. The one from Morro Bay will probably be much larger than this, but it will look something like that. So what about the port requirements to field an offshore floating wind farm? Well, they're pretty substantial. First of all, you need a wharf, uh, room for turbine structure and assembly, because you're going to put the wind turbines together right at the wharf here, right at the water's edge. You're going to need about 2,000 feet of waterfront access, about 6,000 pounds per square foot of pier strength. You need a pretty hefty pier here because you're assembling this thing right there at the pier. You're going to need a huge crane, 700 feet height capacity, about 1,000 tons lift capacity, puts the, the thing together. An upland yard, a couple hundred acres of, of storage for turbine components, fabrication of the substructure. You're going to need access to open sea. That means a deep channel, deep enough to tow the assembled turbine out to sea with no overhead obstructions, no bridges, and so forth. Morage for access vessels, tugboats, and crew access vessels, and also a nearby airfield for helicopter access would be nice because this is the way um, much of the maintenance is done. They fly the people out by a helicopter, lower them down under the top of the nacelle, and then uh, and they go down into the nacelle through some hatch here, do whatever required maintenance is required, and then the helicopter comes back and picks you up. So where is this port going to be? Well, nobody knows right at this point, but I can make a really good guess. I'm almost certain it's going to be Port Wanimi. Port Wanimi is um, about 40 miles south of Santa Barbara down in uh, Ventura County. And I think it meets all of these criteria here. You might say, well, what about the Port of Oakland? Well, it turns out the Port of Oakland, the problem there is the Oakland Bay Bridge. It's just too low. You wouldn't be able to tow the turbines under it. You'd be able to tow them under the, the Golden Gate, but just barely, you know, they're that big. It definitely won't go under the under the Bay Bridge. So I think Port Wanimi is, is most likely that going to be the staging area. What's the cost to fill one of these things? Well, um, most of the cost is comprised of three components, the turbines themselves, the floating substructure, and the electrical infrastructure. That accounts for basically three quarters of the cost. Everything else is fairly small. Even the assembly and installation, which you might think would be really large, is actually only about 8.2% of the cost. What do we think the Morro Bay project is going to cost? Well, my estimate is somewhere in the range of 15 to $25 billion. It's a, it's a big deal. It's a very big project and it's a huge, huge power plant as you'll see in a minute when we get to the capacity. So let's talk about cost. Um, what we're looking at here is something called levelized cost of energy, LCOE, by source in cents per kilowatt hour. That's kind of how our PG&E bill comes, you know, cents per kilowatt hour. So this would be like 4.6 cents per kilowatt hour. And this is average over the entire world, um, all countries. And here you see that offshore, or, or sorry, onshore wind power, the wind turbines we see on land are actually the cheapest power on the grid. In fact, it is the cheapest power in the history of the world. There's never been in the history of the world any time when we, there's been energy cheaper than this. And oh, by the way, solar is going to soon overtake it because the cost of solar keeps coming down and down. Then we have natural gas, geothermal, offshore wind, which is about twice as expensive onshore wind right now, and I'll come back to that, coal, and finally nuclear. Nuclear sticking out like a sore thumb. This is one reason why nuclear energy is going away. At least the second and third generation plants are out there now. It is by far the most expensive power on the grid. Now, the issue is the expense of offshore wind compared to onshore wind. And the, the, um, the really, the issue is there isn't much offshore wind out there now. It's, it's less than 1% of, of total wind power. And um, it, it, offshore wind farms have, have, have not been built yet out to utility scale. Utility scale is 600 megawatts or, or larger. 
And a result, as a result, uh, they don't, they haven't benefited from the economies of scale that onshore wind has benefited from. All projections are that the cost of offshore wind will, con will decline and eventually approach that of onshore wind and be competitive with onshore wind. So what are some examples of existing floating offshore wind farms? As I mentioned before, uh, the vast majority of wind farms are, are, are not floating. They're the, they're the uh, bottom mounted wind farms. All the ones in the US and most of the ones in Europe are, are bottom mounted, but off California, it's gonna be floating. Well, there's actually only two operational floating wind farms in the world right now that are floating uh, wind farms. And um, the first is called uh, High Wind Scotland. It was the world's first large scale floating wind farm deployed off the coast of Scotland in 2017. It has five turbines and it produces 30 megawatts of electricity. The second was uh, Wind Float Atlantic deployed off the coast of Portugal in 2020, three turbines producing 25 megawatts of electricity. Now there are individual floating turbines around in China, for example, in Japan and elsewhere uh, that are sort of one-off designs are really prototype R&D kind of systems. They're not really operational part of an operational wind farm. These really are the only two existing operational wind farms that employ the, employ the floating wind turbine technology. So now let's get into the specifics of the Mora Bay project. First of all, where is it? Well, it's right here. Um, the actual area is this hatch area. Never mind this area right here. That was an earlier proposal. Never mind what these colors mean. The actual area that has been approved by the Biden administration just a few months ago is this hatched area right here. And you can see it is between Cambria and Lucia off Big Sur, about 20 to 30 miles out. This blue area here is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And you can see the wind farm abuts the sanctuary, but does not go into the sanctuary. Here's Morro Bay. And the power will come ashore at Morro Bay and go onto the grid from there. But it's not really off Morro Bay. It's really more off Big Sur. It's north of Morro Bay. So what about the capacity of this wind farm? What will it be all about? Well, it will likely consist of about 375 wind turbines spaced about a mile apart, each with nameplate capacity of 14 megawatts, generating up to 200 amps of 60 cycle three phase AC at 66 kilovolts. This is just my estimates. I mean, no, no one, no company has come forth yet with a proposal or, or anything like that. But just reading the tea leaves, looking where the technology is going, this is, I think, a pretty good guess of where it's going to be. Maybe, maybe greater. By the time it's deployed, you know, there may be 16 or maybe even 18 megawatt uh, turbines out there. So, uh, you know, this may be fairly conservative. There's enough room for 350 to 400 turbines in that, in that region. So I split the difference and said 375 for the purpose of these uh, calculations. I'm assuming a capacity factor of 0.6, which is pretty much the global average for offshore wind turbines. That means putting all these numbers together, that means the wind farm will produce about 3,150 megawatts of power or 3.15 gigawatts of power, making it the highest capacity power plant in the state of California when it's deployed. Uh, you're probably aware of Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, which is gonna be decommissioned in 2025. This wind farm will produce one and a half times the power of Diablo Canyon, it will easily replace Diablo Canyon. And it will produce enough uh, electricity to power about 2 million homes. The likely cost will be about four to six cents per kilowatt hour. And most importantly, replacing the electricity previously provided by gas fired power plants, this wind farm will prevent the emission of over 300 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere over the course of its 25 year design. And that's really the bottom line. Here's a rough timeline for the Moore Bay project. And I st stress the word rough. I'm just making this up and uh, I'll tell you the assumptions I'm making here. First of all, the project was approved by the Biden administration in 2021. Next year, the Department of the Interior will be auctioning off the rights to develop the wind farm. And as I, as I understand it, there are currently about 14 companies expressing interest. Uh, 22 to 2026 20, four-year period, I'm assuming, uh, that's the design and permitting phase. And I'm assuming four years, but it could be as long as seven years. Other wind farms has, have drug out you know, seven years. What happens during this phase is um, uh, the, uh, the companies that have, that, have, that have won the auction to buy the leases, they then come forth publicly with a design and seek a permit from the Department of the Interior. 
during that period, the public weighs in and uh, there are going to be lawsuits. People are going to sue and say, no, don't do it. And they'll have to go through the courts and all that kind of thing. But eventually that all plays out, presumably, and permits are, are issued by the government, by the Department of the Interior. When that happens, I'm, I'm making an optimistic uh, uh, projection that'll happen in 2027. Deployment will begin. I think it'll take about three years to fully, bull, fully build it out. So that means it would be complete and fully operational on the power grid by 2030. Uh, 25 year design life. So beginning about 2052, you're gonna be uh, replacing wind turbines at the end of their 25 year life with new technology. That's roughly what we're talking about here. Okay, so I wanna go into possible issues of concern. And like I've said before, I'm a proponent of this project. I believe the positives outweigh the negatives, but you may come to, to a very different conclusion. And what I wanna do is just try to lay out the issues here for you. The way I see it, there are sort of four big issues. Impact on commercial fishing, impact on whales and dolphins, impact on seabirds, and impact on the Big Sur view shed. So first of all, impact on commercial fishing. Commercial fishing will be banned within the entire 399 square mile area of the Moore Bay wind farm. As toad nets would certainly be in jeopardy of becoming entangled with the mooring lines and electrical cables in the water. On the positive side, the wind farm will effectively serve as a very large marine protected area and a habitat for many types of fish. Thus, it will help rebuild and sustain fish populations in the surrounding waters. In any case, the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, which represents fishermen's associations up the entire Pacific Coast, has come out in strong opposition to the Moore Bay wind farm. They basically don't wanna give up this, uh, this as a fishing ground and they would be forced to do so if this goes forward. Now, let me say, uh, I have a great respect for fishermen. Uh, they put food on our table and they pursue a very dangerous profession. So their voices need to be heard on this issue and I'm sure their voices will be heard. Second issue is impact on whales and dolphins. And let me tell you up front, I am not a whale expert. There are a number of world-class whale experts in our area, I'm not one of them. Uh, but I have done a little bit of research on this and I at least I think I can lay out the basic issues here. And there's sort of two basic issues the way I see it possible impact of noise in the water from the turbines on whales and possible impact on whales of electric and magnetic field emissions from the dynamic array cables that carry all that electricity. Now this pink area here uh, lays out um, the, uh, the gray whale migration zone down our coast. A little bit misleading though, because most of the whales stay close to shore. They stay within about six to seven miles from shore. Some of them stray farther offshore. Most of them are, 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 are here closer to shore. Well, here's the Moore Bay wind farm right here. So although most of the whales are going to be well inshore of that, it's inevitable that some whales are going to find their way into the wind farm area and, and, and find themselves transiting the wind farm. So what are the issues there? Well, the first one is um, the um, uh, noise in the water. There's no doubt that these turbines are going to produce noise. Um, and uh, low frequency noise, it's gonna be emanating from them. And if, well, what we need to do is think about how, how, much, how strong is that noise going to be? So let's take a look at undersea sound sources here. Now bear with me, this is pretty technical here. But what we're looking at on the, ver on the vertical axis here is noise level in decibels or dB. And what we're looking on at on the horizontal axis here is frequency of the noise in kilohertz. And it's a logarithmic scale here. So for example, this blue bar here is the hearing range of humans. And if you were down here, you're talking about like the lowest note you can play on the piano. Whereas if you're up here, you're talking about the highest note you can play on the piano. So that's, you know, it's a change in pitch from low frequency to high frequency, low pitch to high pitch. And um, these uh, green bars here are the hearing ranges of various uh, animals. This, for example, is the fin whale. This is the bottlenose dolphin, goldfish, Atlantic cod. So um, what we see, uh, beginning with the most noisy things under the sea, uh, are undersea earthquakes, uh, seafloor volcanic, volcanic eruptions. Then you have sonar from Navy ships and uh, seismic air gun arrays, which are used by the um, oil industry to prospect for oil. Then going down, you have a, a blue whale right here, a super tanker right here. This would be a medium-sized Navy ship. 
This would be the, the noise produced by a drilling rig, noise produced by a humpback whale, bowhead whale, dolphins, sperm whale, dolphins. Uh, distant shipping would be down here. So where does the wind turbine come into play? Well, the wind turbine would be right about here. So it it's, it's goes from lower frequency, frequencies that are too low, basically the very low vibrations that that um, uh, whales can't hear. What is it? Why does the sound come from? By the way, it's because the, the, the turbine is is turning, and you know there's a lot of machine noise associated with you know uh, you know uh, uh, ball bearings and things like that. And there's vibration that, that's transmitted down the tower into the floating substructure and then out into the water. Um, but it's pretty low. You know, it's it's definitely lower than a drilling rig. Uh, it's comparable to a submarine. Uh, pretty quiet comparable to what whales produce themselves. Uh, you know, here's the humpback, here's the bowhead, dolphin whistles. It's within their hearing range for sure, but it's pretty low. And uh, the conclusion I draw from this is they're going to notice it, but it's not going to really have any significant impact on the whale migration. That's the conclusion I draw in any case, others may come to a different conclusion. The other issue is um, electric and magnetic field emissions from the electrical cables. Um, Again, a little bit technical here, but um, imagine this is one of the uh, cables here and there's electricity flowing through this cable. It's 60 cycle alternating current electricity. Now the electric field is gonna be maintained, contained within the cable. The, um, it, the cables are very well insulated and very well armored. They're also very well grounded. So I'm not worried about the electric field leaking out. That's not gonna be a problem. The problem is when you have a fluctuating electric field here, you also have, also have a flat, fluctuating magnetic field, and you can't contain the magnetic field, it will be transmitted outside of the cable. Um, it'll be weak, uh, about uh, 0.5 microteslas at 10 meters distance. That's quite a bit weaker than you know, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, but because you have that fluctuating magnetic field, it will also induce a fluctuating electric field outside of the, cur uh, outside of the cable, even though the cable is well insulated, the magnetic field will be outside, it'll be fluctuating, and as a result, it will induce an electric field. When you have an induced electric field in the presence of a conductor, electricity flows. Um, now, seawater is a conductor, so the, there will be electricity flowing in the seawater, but it'll be very weak, about 10 microamps per square meter at a distance of 10 meters, and both the magnetic field and the electric field fall off very rapidly with distance. Now, if you were a diver and you came down here and you put your hand on this cable, you wouldn't notice anything. You wouldn't, you wouldn't feel it. It's far too small for you to feel. On the other hand, um, if you were a shark, a ray or a skate, you would notice it. They're very, very, very electrosensitive. And in fact, uh, sharks, rays, and skates have exhibited a uh, reaction to these kinds of cables. They usually have a mildly attractive reaction, but they do, they do respond to them. Whales, on the other hand, are not electrosensitive. They are not going to be affected by this electric field. However, whales are known to sense magnetic fields and in fact, use the Earth's magnetic field to help navigate. And whales would be able to sense the magnetic field emitted by the cables at a distance of about 10 meters, but probably not beyond about 20 or 30 meters distance. So again, the effect is gonna be very, very um, uh, uh, constrained, very narrowly constrained here and certainly won't be, won't be anything that would be harmful to the whales, but they would, they would sense it if they pass close to the electric cables. Next issue is impact on seabirds. Now, millions of seabirds exist off the coast of California, and the area that will be occupied by the wind farm is certainly part of their habitat. Unfortunately, wind turbines do kill birds, but there is technology available to reduce the number of kills. Uh, for example, there's bird detection radar. It can actually see a flock of birds three to five miles away, track them, and as if they're approaching a, a wind turbine, it can automatically shut the turbine down until the flock passes. That's used uh, pretty widely over land. A couple of different companies manufacture these things. Also, uh, very simply, uh, simply painting one of the blades black produces kind of a strobing effect. That has been shown to reduce bird kills by about 70% over land. So that technology could very easily be employed. And finally, there's the issue of um, the fact that seabirds tend to fly close to the surface and most likely will fly in the air gap below the rotor blades. There's this air gap from the surface up to the blade here. Most seabirds are flying pretty close to the surface. That's where their food source is. 
And so that will help mitigate uh, bird deaths. In any case, the Audubon Society supports offshore wind development, recognizing that climate change is killing many, many birds each year, that offshore wind power is, a, is, a, is part of the long-term solution. Final issue is impact on the Big Sur view shed. Now I wanna point your attention to this handy dandy equation here, which says the distance in miles that you can see something out on the ocean is equal to this expression right here, where H um, is the height of the object above the sea level and, and small h is the height of your eye above sea level. So um, if you plug in the numbers here for the Moore Bay project, you find that um, uh, in fact, the upper two thirds of the turbine tower would be visible above the horizon a distance of about 42 miles. If you're, you're driving on the highway one and a typical level elevation is about 400 feet. Uh, the bottom line is a number of these turbines will be above the horizon. And uh, if on a clear day, uh, viewing conditions are right, you'll be able to see them. But you'll have to look hard to see them as they will appear as specks on the horizon. And in fact, here's a picture of what they will appear like. This is a simulated view of the wind farm from Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park, produced by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management here. And if you look very closely, you'll see these dots right here. Those are the wind turbines. Now, this would be optimum conditions. This would be morning on a clear day. On a hazy day, you're not gonna see them. In the afternoon, even on a clear day, not gonna see them, too much glare off the water. But in the morning, on a clear day, they would appear like this. If you have a modest pair of, of um, binoculars, uh, they'll look like this. And in fact, you'll even be able to see the rotors turning. Uh, will this bother people? It's not gonna bother me, but there are some people who might be bothered by this. Uh, and so that's an issue for people to, to think about. So in summary, we face a climate crisis that is growing worse by the year. Offshore wind power is a key technology for reducing CO2 emissions and mitigating this crisis. The Morro Bay offshore wind farm was recently approved by the Biden administration. Deployment of this massive wind farm will likely begin in about six years and be complete by 2030, when it will become the largest capacity power plant in California and provide enough carbon-free electricity to power at least 2 million average size homes and prevent the emission of over 300 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere over its 25 year design life. Although there are areas of concern, in my judgment, none of these concerns are showstoppers for this project. I personally believe the Moore Bay wind farm should be deployed and that its successful implementation will serve as a model for other offshore wind projects in the US and around the world aimed at fighting climate change. So that's it. And I'm gonna stop the share now and open it up to questions. Um, jump in anybody. I have, I have a, just kind of a couple things in review. Sure. Uh, the entire wind farm uh, cost, did you say 25 billion? 15 to 25 billion in that range. And are there other uh, wind farm locations uh, in the planning stages? Is this, is this the farthest one along in the United States? Well, there are operational wind farms on the, on the East Coast. Uh, right, and, and they were small. They were three to yeah, eight or yeah, something. Yeah, they're bottom mounted and they're, they're fairly small. This will be by far the largest. It'll be the far largest in the world when it's deployed the largest power plant in California. Uh, when Mora Bay was approved, they also approved a similar but smaller wind farm for Humboldt County off the coast of California. And the Biden administration just announced yesterday, Secretary Holland, who's head of the uh, Department of the Interior, announced intentions to, uh, to, lease, to, to sell leases for at least seven additional projects uh, on the East Gulf and West Coast. So, you know, if they're, they're going great guns. Then again, the goal is 30 gigawatts of offshore wind power by 2030. Morro Bay will represent about 10% of that. Morro Bay will be about three gigawatts, about 10% of, of the administration's goal for 2030. And uh, you said, I think that there are maybe seven uh, entities interested. I assume they're all private corporations. 14 and uh, private corporations. Yes, there's a couple. There's one up in San Francisco, a couple of them up in the Bay Area, I think. And uh, very possible they'll they'll kind of join together and form consortia, you know, to to bid on the on the projects and so forth. Uh, there's some European interest. You know, some of the wind turbines are made in Europe. Uh, 
So I think there, I don't think there'll be any shortage of, of uh, companies willing to bid on this. And uh, do you know if there are any oil companies interested or are these non-oil structures? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the interesting part about this, much of the technology uh, for the floating substructure, you know, to support these wind turbines is borrowed directly from the oil industry. So many of the em employees who have worked in the oil industry will very likely transition over and, and work in the wind industry, building very similar technology. The, 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 uh, the uh, semi-submersible substructure is just like a scaled down version of a floating oil, oil rig. And uh, so I think a lot of those jobs will transition over. And just going to oil uh, a little more in the Gulf, are you say most or all of the oil rigs there are uh, grounded? Uh, well, there are some there. I'm not an expert on oil rigs, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of floating oil rigs there that okay. employ the same technology as the floating substructure we're talking about, the uh, semi-submersible substructure. All of the um, wind turbines that are currently operational, offshore wind turbines currently operational in the U.S. are are the bottom mounted. Morro Bay will be the first, uh, assuming it happens in 2030, will be the first floating offshore wind farm in the U.S. Um, let me go to some of the committee members here, and uh, okay. I have some more questions too. Okay. Just speak up, anybody. Okay, it's Marianne. Um, I'm Ian. Hi, Mike. Um, you spoke about the fact that commercial fishermen are not happy with this territory being taken out of fishing. Yes. yes. Um, it, uh, I, I really didn't have a chance to read about the Biden plan to um, license these or whatever, approve these mm -hmm. for all, along the coastlines. But yes. I was just wondering, um, is there resistance from the commercial shipping industry? Is it problematic for them? Yeah, I haven't heard anything on that so far. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem. They, it, it's, it's not in a, in a shipping lane. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean the odd ship is not going to find themselves, you know, near that wind farm. But um, I'm not too concerned about that. The, the wind farm will be, well, first of all, the, the turbines will have lights on the top of them, and it'll be flashing lights, it'll be visible. But also, they will present a huge radar cross section. So right. Right, You'd have right. to try really hard to hit them if you're in a, in a, in a commercial ship. I don't think that's going to happen. Right. And, and remind me, I mean, you told us that there was room between, for between 350 and 400. What is the spacing again? One mile, about one mile, roughly. Yeah. And then, of course, they move around about two or three football fields within that one mile. Um, I, I'm, I got a few more questions. I read yeah. somewhere and I... I was looking for my note, but now I can't. Oh, here it is. Um, they said the concerns for wind turbines face three um, kind of prohibitions. I don't say prohibition, that's too strong, but uh, mm -hmm. issues that need to be addressed in the location of any of these wind turbines. One, mm -hmm. I'm going to list four of them and then give you a shot. Uh, they must not interfere with endangered species, must not interfere with military needs, uh, archaeological sites, which I think deep ocean probably doesn't exist, and coastal industries. Do you have any perspective on, I mean, these, they probably all pass, but what's the relationship of those issues to this wind farm? Yeah, well, uh, I'll take the second one first, um, military operations. The, the Navy was actually the last uh, agency to hold out, and it was, uh, you know, uh, when the administration was looking to give the go-ahead on this, the Navy was the last one to, to hold out. And they basically said they didn't want to give up the training area because they they, they use, do some training out there. You're no longer going to be able to run submarines through that region. And so the Navy was reluctant to give it up, but they, but they finally came around. Uh, with regard to endangered species, um, you know, I, I don't think we have to worry about um, that too much. I mean, I, the, the main impact, I think, is going to be on birds. It, it, you know, there's no doubt they're going to kill some birds. I don't know that we have any endangered species um, living out there and as in that habitat, but uh, that would be something you know for uh, experts to, to to weigh in on. I am encouraged by the fact that the Audubon Society does support offshore wind development, archaeological sites. I don't think that's a problem. Um, uh, wind industry, it's going to create a lot of jobs. You know, it's it's not going to interfere with any industry other than the commercial fishing industry. 
Um, but it's also going to create a lot of jobs. There's going to be a lot of jobs for um, uh, workers to, to fabricate and service these wind turbines and, and so forth. Um, two other questions. What's, what does the one black blade do? Well, I think it produces sort of a, a strobing effect. You know, you get kind of a, you know, a, the turning like that, you, that got contrast between white and black. I think that attracts the bird's attention more clearly and, and it allows them to see the, the turbine better and avoid it. Um, I kind of lost track of my other question, right? Oh no, I, uh, <laughs> the location uh, is in federal waters and not state waters. Yeah, that's a really good question and an interesting question. Yeah, <clears throat> the, um, the way that goes is, uh, the state has jurisdiction from the coast out three miles. That's state, those are state waters. From three miles out to 12 miles out, those are federal waters. That's US federal waters. Well, this wind turbine is going to be 20 to 30 miles out. So it's actually going to be outside US territorial waters, but within the EEZ, the, the uh, exclusive economic zone. Now, the US claims a 200 mile EEZ, the US also claims a 12 mile territorial limit. But the interesting thing is the U.S. has never signed the Law of the Sea Treaty. There's the U.N. Law of the Sea Treaty, which specifies those things. We have never signed that treaty, much less ratified it. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've raised the question, what if some country, country comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, you guys aren't part of the Law of the Sea Treaty. We, we don't recognize your EEZ. You know, we're going to go out and drill up for oil out there, or we're going to put it in our own wind farm out there. Well, I, I had a, a person who's a lawyer who, who specializes in that kind of thing and says, well, it would be grandfathered in. Even though we haven't signed the treaty, it's been so many years that other countries have recognized our claim on a 200 mile EEZ that it would stand up in an international court of law. But the interesting point is, you know, it, it's outside US federal territorial waters, but within our EEZ. Now, will the state have a say in this? And the answer is yes, because the cable has to come across state waters. It has to go across that three mile limit. The export cable is gonna bring the power ashore. So the state has a say on that part of it. And also um, uh, the Coastal Commission, which I guess comes under the state, has a, certainly a, a role to play because the Coastal Commission will weigh in on things that happen right at the coast. For example, the export cable coming ashore with all that power and also what goes on at the, at the, uh, the Moore Bay power plant, which is right at the coast. So yes, the state will have a play. Uh, when the announcement was made by the Biden administration uh, two months ago, uh, Governor Newsom was right there and was very strongly encouraging and weighing in on this. So he's very supportive of this. And I think the state at this point anyway is very supportive of this project going forward. Well, and one of the reasons for asking that question is what's the status of the uh, fishing industry in terms of the legal status they have in terms of challenging things? Well, you know, during that, that um, design and permitting phase, the public gets a say. And just like if, you know, if, the, if uh, an oil company came in here and was going to drill off the coast, there'd be a permitting phase and the public would have a say. And so that's the time when uh, the fishermen's associations will come in and make their case. And very likely there will be lawsuits. There will be lawsuits that will go through the courts and be, you know, various levels of appeal and so forth. And that's what can cause these things to drag out. But ultimately, you know, at some point, those lawsuits get settled, and and either the permits are issued or not permitted or, or not issued, and their permits are issued, and the pro this project goes forward. But they certainly will have they will certainly have standing to sue. I'm going to go with Howard next, and then Sharon. Hi, Mike. It's Howard Fossil. Hi, Howard. Hi. Uh, is there any storage uh, capability on the tower itself, and what's to keep the the cable? from being snagged by an anchor? Yeah, great questions. Uh, there is limited storage capability on, on, on the wind farm itself. It has you know, some battery, cap battery capability, but it's just really just enough to, to uh, allow it to operate its you know, internal workings, the computers and so forth, if the, if the wind it goes down. Um, but along those lines, they're building a, a very large battery energy storage system comparable to the one at Moss Landing at the Mora Bay, um, more of a uh, power plant. So that'll help smooth out the, the power availability from this system. Um, with regard to a, 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 an, an anchor you know, line snagging it, that certainly could happen if a ship goes in there and drags an anchor, but it will certainly be um, well marked on mariners uh, charts. You know, this is an, an area where you, you, know, you, you can't do that, you know, avoid this area. 
but you know it could happen you know a, you know a foreign country you know a bad actor could come in and and with a fairly small ship could could tow a, an anchor through there and do some damage mm -hmm. thank you Aaron? the oil the oh, sorry. oil line that was uh, snagged recently it was said yep. to have been at minimum of 10 feet deep in in the in the bottom of the ocean there uh and yet an anchor got it it's something say war yeah, it, it may not really have been 10 feet deep as they, they might have claimed that, but it may not have been. But you know, these these array cables and mooring cables are gonna are gonna be above. They're not gonna be below. They're, they're suspended in the water column. Wouldn't be hard at all to snag them. The export cable that brings all the power ashore, that is embedded below the surf, below the seafloor. But the array cables are are suspended in the water column and it would be very easy. That's why you can't do commercial fishing in there because the nets would almost certainly snag on them. And you can't run between them then, huh? Well, not, you know, the, the cables go between the, the turbines and, you know, you wouldn't want to, you know, if you had a, a ship going, you know, between the turbines, very strong possibility it would snag something if it was towing an anchor or a, a fishing net. Thank you. Uh, we're queuing up. So Sharon, Marianne, and then Marlene. Good here. You mentioned the design and permitting phase, and I yes. had been thinking that I would like to hear more from all of the stakeholders, from all the different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. So I wonder when that you might suggest that the design and permitting phase would start, and I guess that'll be when we can give input, when we can, yes. it'll be public hearings, but I'm not sure which government agency or agencies will be involved in setting that up so those are yeah. my questions yeah um the rough timeline is next year 2022 would be the leasing phase and that's when companies will will you know have an auction to, to build a, you know to win these leases and then once they have got the lease they will make uh known their proposal and that proposal will be here here's how many turbines we're going to put out here Here's the size of these turbines. Here's what, here's how we're going to design the electrical cables. So I think it'll be a lot along the lines of what I described today. And at that point, um, that's when the public has a chance to weigh in. Now, ultimately, it's the Department of the Interior has the um, the lead on this permitting phase, and they're the ones who who would uh, who would conduct you know these public meetings and so forth. And in particular, B O E M. BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. It's the same, it's the same part of the Department of Interior that does the permitting um, and leasing for the oil industry. And there's a branch that does it for the offshore wind industry now. So they're the BOEM, BOEM, they would be the ones who would have the lead under the Department of the Interior. Other aid government agencies will be players, for example, NOAA, NOAA Fisheries. No fisheries would be in there in with regard to the impact on on uh, you know uh, fisheries and and uh, and you know uh, spe endangered species potentially um, you know you know the um, Department of Energy would be involved DOE Department of Energy would be involved Department of Defense would be involved what are the implications for uh, the Navy and so forth. So there'll be a lot of government agencies involved, but um, the Department of the Interior is the, will be the lead agency and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management will be the lead part of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Marianne? Um, yeah, this is somewhat related to what Sharon's asking about. I'm thinking about the background of how this came to be because it's a little unusual. I'm more accustomed to the situation where an energy developer has a vision and brings it for approval, but yeah. it, right? And so um, I was wondering about that and a little bit more about how this particular section of the coast was selected. I see it is quite near the uh, Diablo power plant. And I wondered whether they thought that, you know, without using so much transmission capacity that it would be bringing power into that same area, whether they were looking ahead to the decommissioning. That's part of it. Um, in fact, this did originate with private industry. The, the, uh, what happens is various companies um, will make proposals to uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management saying, we want to develop wind power in this region, and that's called a call area. And then uh, Department of the Interior, working through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, looks at that 
And ultimately they'll come forth and, and either approve or disapprove the idea of, of a particular region. Remember when I showed that, that map that showed the location of the wind farm with regard to Big Sur, and there were different, different lines and different colors. Those were different proposed areas. And finally that hatched area is the one they finally, finally settled on and approved. And what company was that, or who was that that initially then? There's forward? a company called Castle Wind, and that's a consortium of a couple of different companies. And there's a couple of other companies, I can't remember their names, that, that put out various proposals. And, um, you know, they look at things like proximity to Morro Bay power plant, which is where the power is going to come ashore. They look at things like um, where are the shipping lanes? How much is this going to interfere with shipping? Or, you know, would that be an issue? What about commercial fishing? What about whale migration? They look at all those issues and try to optimize on that. Notice that they don't go into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. They come right up to it and stop. And that's because I'm sure there would be legal issues associated with developing wind power inside the sanctuary. So it's a consortium. And then just the, so the final thing I want to clarify, and those companies, then someone will be bidding and will they be the manufacturer? How integrated is this industry in terms of manufacturing of the equipment and placement of operation of the actual wind farm? Yeah, great question. I, I, there's a strong possibility it'll become pretty integrated because I, I know that um, one of the consortia I, I read about had an interest in this did involve a European company that manufactures turbines. Um, I think what, what's going to happen when this project goes forward that there will be a one or more large facilities built on the west coast of North America. I'm not saying the west coast of the United States, but the west coast of North America to fabricate the turbines. I think they'll be built somewhere fairly nearby. Could be in Mexico, could be in Central America, could be in California, who knows. I don't think we're gonna be shipping them from Europe, which is where they're built now. So I think that's gonna happen, might be coming from China. And you know, China is, has one of the major uh, companies that develops offshore wind turbines. They, they could ship them from China. Um, and, but uh, yeah, there, there's probably gonna be some fairly close arrangement between the, the company that's the sort of the systems integrator that deploys the wind farm and the company that manufactures the turbines. General Electric is a major player although they build their turbines in, in France, not in the US. Uh, Siemens, the, Ger the uh, a German company is a major player. And there's a company called uh, Mingyang SE, Mingyang Sustainable Energy in China, which builds right now the world's largest offshore wind turbine. So those are the kind of companies that would be coming into play here. And it wouldn't be at all surprising if the company or combination of companies that wins this, this project would, would be closely aligned with one of those companies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Merlene? If, uh, <laughs> maybe a silly question, I don't know, but if uh, when if global warming, climate warming uh, produces more in the way of um, hurricanes in our area, um, shipping could be blown off course. Uh, what possible damage is anticipated, any? Well, I don't think we need to worry about hurricane within the lifetime of this project, 25 years, I don't think we need to worry about hurricanes coming this far north in California. Maybe in a century that could happen as the ocean gets warmer and warmer. Um, certainly we can have severe winter storms. That's, that's a big uh, concern. The, the engineers that will have to sit down and design this, and this will be part of the presentations they'll make during that permitting phase that the, that the public will have a chance to review and comment on. Part of that engineering analysis will be, you know, what are what are the highest winds we can expect to occur over this 25-year period or maybe even 100-year period, and we have to design to be able to handle that. So that will come into play. Um, in terms of shipping being blown off course, you know, that's always a possibility. But if a ship hits one of these turbines, um, you know, it's going to have to be a, a really a failure on the part of the of the ship's crew to, for that to happen. But it's possible it can happen. If it happens, I think uh, you know the worst that would happen is a, a couple of the turbines would be would be knocked off their mooring and 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 would automatically shut down and you know there might be some electricity lucky leaking into the water for a while. I don't think it would be terribly catastrophic. I mean, it's nothing like a nuclear power plant failure or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, two other quick questions. Well, no, go ahead, Howard. You're muted.
You're still muted, Howard. We'll come back to Howard. I'm going to ask you my question. Okay. Uh, uh, the and Howard, when you unmute, you can, you can get back in the queue. Um, <laughs> are there any uh, particular besides the scale issue, just the size of, and scale of things? Are there any engineering or design hurdles that you see still are challenging to this kind of uh, in, uh, this this uh, this kind of project? Well, the thing I think it's going to be new and pretty challenging is the fact that the water is really deep out there. You know, this is, you know, like I said, there are these two wind farms that have been deployed, High Wind Scotland and Wind Float Atlantic, but they're not in nearly as deep a water as we're talking about here. You know, the, the uh, continental shelf falls off so rapidly off the coast of California that you, know, you go 20, 30 miles out and now you're talking about 3,000 feet of water. That's pretty deep. And uh, as a result, you're going to be putting a lot of mooring line and a lot of cable into the water. And, uh, you know, it, it, if you sit down and, and, and calculate how much mooring line and cable you're going to come to an amazing conclusion, it's like, you know, thousands, a thousand, couple thousand miles of cable and, and mooring line. So um, that's certainly an engineering issue. Um, I think the, the environment is pretty benign. Uh, you know, it's not like the Gulf Coast where you're going to get run over by a hurricane every few years. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, the, 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 even the winter storms are not that bad down in that region. So I think the environment is relatively benign. I think the biggest engineering challenge is going to be uh, dealing with the depth of the water there. And uh, uh, that'll be, it'll be new. I mean, I'm not saying it's something that can be overcome, but I don't think there's a, an example where that's been anything comparable to that so far. Are there likely to be um, a couple of um installations and then wait and see or learn from the first couple or 10 or so? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, that, that question came up uh, in one of my earlier talks on this issue. And the question is, you know, with regard to the impact on whales and so forth, you know, what about, you know, sort of building out a, a pilot project of, you know, 10% of the project and see what the implications are and then, you know, get approval for a phase two to go to 50% build out. That's possible. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing that could come up during the permitting phase, and, and the public may may say well, we want to do it this way, and and then might be some negotiation between the the companies and the public, and some of it might play out in courts. And but that is, I think that's a possibility. Uh, thank you, Howard. Yes, thank you, um, Mike. I'm just trying to envision this. Is it, is it safe to to kind of assume that it's going to be sort of like a wall? where the ships won't be able to go because of the, the diameter of the float zone of these things being so unpredictable, uh, would it be impossible for the ships to travel through this wall? Well, if you're in a relatively small boat, you know, like a tugboat or a, you know, a small fishing boat and you're not towing a net, uh, you wouldn't have any trouble na navigating through this array. You know, they're about a mile apart. And yes, they're gonna move around, but that's gonna happen pretty slowly. You're going to have a good visual on them during the daytime. At nighttime, you can use your radar and you'll have no trouble seeing them. Um, the issue would be if you're towing it, you know, an anchor, like mentioned earlier, or towing a net, um, then the possibility of getting of entanglement is certainly strong. So I think what's going to happen is it'll be, it'll be, um, you know, the Coast Guard would would take a look at this and presumably they would, on the chart, maritime charts, they would. Uh, delineate this as a probably a no-go zone for ships of a certain size. So it would be a wall for bigger ships. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and that's part of the issue for fishermen too. They think, well, okay, fine, we're, we, we might be fishing out beyond this, this wind farm, right. but if we're forced to go around it and then go around it back coming in, you know, that adds a lot to our expenses, never mind the fact we can't even fish in there where we'd like to. So you can see, that, you know, the issues they have. And, th and that same issue has played out, by the way, on the East Coast. A lot of fishermen, you know, uh, had lots of objections and their objections with regard to, to the view shed as well. So a lot of these issues have already played out uh, on the East Coast and, and been resolved in courts. And so I don't, don't have any expectation that it would be resolved here. And there may have to be some give and take on both sides. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, I want to wrap this up. I want to... <laughs> Thank you so much for what you've done. I've got uh, and what you present. I think it's absolutely fascinating. 
Great. What I'm curious about is if it go on, it goes on to YouTube. Will you let me know when or whatever, sure. and I'll sure look for it and I'll spread it around to other members and sure probably other people. I it's just a fantastic presentation. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I should be able to put it on my YouTube channel here in the next few days, and as soon as I do that, I'll send the link out to you. Thank thank you very much. And okay, thanks. okay, and uh, thank you. I enjoyed it. I always always enjoy speaking to this group, and you guys had some great questions. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.